So we're going to go over some of the exercises from Combinations Part 2. Um, we started this before spring break, and it's been a while. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we have a chance to go over some of these problems. Number one we did in class already, so I'm going to skip that, but I'll go over the rest. So question two, a lot of you have already tried in class. The idea is we want to try to figure out how many triangles we can form using the points shown below. Um, so we're not allowing what we're calling degenerate triangles, triangles with three vertices on the same line. So if we chose these three vertices, for instance, that doesn't count as a triangle. And we're trying to figure out how many triangles we can form. So having gone around and asked people in class, I got a lot of different answers. So I want to talk about three different methods for counting these numbers of triangles. Um, so in the first case, we can start off by doing something that we know isn't going to work, but then correct for that. So for example, there's a total of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 dots total. So we could start off by saying 11 choose 3 counts the number of ways to choose any three dots here. Right? That's what we're doing when we're forming a triangle. We're choosing three of these dots. But we know that that's going to overcount because it's going to account for choices like those degenerate triangles we talked about, right? So choosing these three vertices, which doesn't actually form a triangle, or choosing these three vertices, which doesn't actually form a triangle. So this number is too big, and to account for that, we need to take out any degenerate triangles, any triangles that were formed by choosing three vertices along one line. Well, how many degenerate triangles would, would this account for? If we chose three vertices along this first line here, there's one, two, three, four, five dots to choose from. And if we chose three of them, then we wouldn't want to count those. So there's five choose three many ways to pick three vertices along this line. Similarly, along this line, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven vertices. If we chose any three along this line, that would be a degenerate triangle and it wouldn't count. So we want to subtract those seven choose three many. But any other choice of three vertices is going to give us a unique triangle, and it's going to be one that's not degenerate, right? It'll, it'll have at least one from each of the rows and the columns. Okay, so this is one way to count the number of triangles, and you could compute this if you want to, but this expression is enough. All right, method two is a little bit different. The way method two would work would be to say, well, I don't want to overcount. I don't want to start off by overcounting like I did in part one. I only want to account for choosing two vertices along the column and one along the row, or two along the row and one along the column, right? So we could say there's one, two, three, four, five dots in this column. So there's five choose two ways to choose two vertical dots or two dots on the vertical column. And then we need to choose one dot that's not in this column, right? Because we don't want to re-choose this, this bottom one here and we don't want a degenerate triangle. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six remaining vertices and we need to choose one. So this accounts for any triangles where we choose two from the vertical line and one from the horizontal. Or we could do it the other way around. We could choose two along the bottom. Okay, so there's seven dots along the bottom row and we're choosing two. And then one, not counting the corner here, one, two, three, four, we have to choose one of the four remaining dots in the column. And this almost works, except the problem is that some of these triangles are gonna be counted twice using these two different methods. In particular, any triangle that was formed using this corner vertex, for example, if you chose, let's label these A, B, and C. If you chose A and B, on the vertical side and then C on the horizontal side, it's going to give you the same triangle as if you had chosen B and C in the, in the horizontal line and then chosen just A in the horizontal line. Ugh, vertical line. Okay, and so any triangle that uses this corner vertex, which I'm labeling B, is going to get double counted. So what we need to do is we need to account for that, right, using principle of inclusion exclusion and subtract any triangle that uses that corner vertex here. So how many triangles use a corner vertex? Well, it would have to use the corner vertex and one of these, one, two, three, four vertices, and then one of these, one, two, three, four, five, six horizontal vertices. So this accounts for the double counting
of every right triangle, of every triangle that uses the vertex B. Okay, so I leave it up to you to actually compute this and make sure that it matches what we got in method one. You should get the same thing both times. Now there's one last way that we could have done this without using any kind of overcounting at all. Right, one thing that we could have done is we could have just eliminated this corner vertex, the one that I had called B before, I'll call that B again, and only count, first count all of the non-right triangles that use two of these vertical vertices and one of the horizontal. So in this case now we only have four verticals to choose from, and we're choosing two, and then one, two, three, four, five, six horizontals to choose from and choose one. So we're saying first count the number of triangles that choose two of these and one of these so it won't be a right triangle because we've eliminated B. Right, then do the symmetric thing along the bottom, choose two of these six and only one of these four. And this is gonna count for every non-right triangle, so the last thing we need to do is add in all of the right triangles. So all the triangles that do include B. And we've already counted them up above. We were subtracting it here, but now we're adding it because we have not yet accounted for the right triangles. So four choose one times six choose one. And again, double check, make sure all of these expressions are the same. But in the end, we have these three different expressions that are all equal to each other. They're all counting the same thing. And that's cool, but what's actually really neat is that we can find a similar solution not using just these exact 11 dots, but using any number of dots. So we can generalize this. Right before, this was sort of our, these four dots, let's say this is your N, and these six dots, we'll call that your K, right? You could extend this to any number of dots down here and any number of dots vertically, plus that one in the middle. And essentially what you have here is the expression n plus k plus 1, that's your total number of dots, choose 3, minus 5, choose 3, would be the vertical number, so that would be n plus 1, choose 3, and then minus 7, that's the number of horizontal dots, so that's k plus 1, choose 3. Okay, using a similar method here, we have n plus 1, choose 2, times k choose 1 plus k plus 1 choose 2 times n choose 1 minus n choose 1 times k choose 1. And in the last case, 4 choose 2 would be n choose 2 times k choose 1 plus k choose 2 times n choose 1 plus n choose one times k choose one. Right, using that same exact reasoning, these three expressions are always gonna be equal to each other for any n and k that are greater than one. Right, greater than or equal to one even, which is kinda neat. Right, so we can use this idea of, of double counting or counting in two different ways to prove that all sorts of different expressions are equal to each other. Okay, so that was number two. Um, number three is a little bit more simple. Number three, all it's asking us to do is to find the expansion of x plus y to the eighth power. And we know now that this is just a simple application of the binomial theorem. Essentially, what we'd have to do if we wanted to actually do it with number coefficients is we'd want to continue Pascal's triangle down to the eighth row and use that eighth row to find your coefficients. So we start off with x to the eighth for the first term. Then we decrease the exponent on x and increase the exponent on y all the way down the line x to the 6th y squared, x to the 5th y cubed, x to the 4th y to the 4th, plus x cubed y to the 5th, plus x squared y to the 6th, plus x1 y to the 7th, and finally plus y to the 8th. And if we had the eighth row of Pascal's triangle, we could just copy in those coefficients. But we don't even really need to because the whole point of the binomial theorem is you can find those coefficients using so n choose k's. In this case, eight choose something. So we start off with eight choose the exponent on the y term, so eight choose zero, and eight choose one, eight choose two, eight choose three, 
eight choose four, eight choose five, eight choose six, eight choose seven, and eight choose eight. Right, whatever those numbers are, it doesn't really matter. This is a perfectly good expansion. Okay, so that was number three. And number four gets really interesting. So let's read back over here and see what they want us to do. They want us to find the alternating sum of each row of Pascal's triangle. Alternating sum means you let your first term be positive, second term is negative, third term is positive, and you alternate it until you get to the nth term, which will be positive or negative depending on whether it's n is even or odd, and see what you get as a result of that sum. All right? so let's do that in each case here. I'm gonna use a different color. In row zero, I only have one term, and that term is one. So the alternating sum, I guess, put it here. Alternating sum here is just one. Um, but in row two, we need to let our first term be positive and our second term be negative, right? So one minus one is zero. All right, second row we have first term positive, then negative, then positive. One minus two plus one is zero, All right? And we continue, negative, positive, negative. This alternating sum is also zero. Negative, positive, negative, positive. This alternating sum is zero. And actually every single time you get an alternating sum of zero, which is kind of neat, except for of course in, in the case of row zero. There's only one term to do there. All right, so why is this happening? This is kind of strange. Um, in some cases, it, it makes perfect sense, right? What we've learned so far is that Pascal's triangle is symmetric. It reads the same each row forward and backwards. And that makes sense because n choose k is equal to n choose n minus k, right? So it would make sense that, for example, in this fifth row here, we end up with a positive one and a negative one, a negative five and a positive five, positive 10 and negative 10. And those terms cancel each other out. Same thing here in row three and in row one. But in the other rows, it's a lot more surprising because you have one minus two plus one, where you have two, two positive ones, two negative fours, and a positive six. They're not canceling each other out in the same way, right? The four and the four don't cancel each other out because they have the same sign. So in every time we have an even row, we get this result that's a little bit surprising. Now I'm gonna try to rewrite this using binomial coefficients, using n choose k's to see exactly what's going on here. And I'll use the sixth row as an example. Remember, this first term is six choose zero. This is six choose one, six choose two, six choose three, six choose four, six choose five, six choose six. And we're subtracting, then adding, subtracting, adding, subtracting, adding, and getting that the result is zero. All right. Now, what is this telling us here? It's saying if you look at six choose zero, this is the number of subsets of a six element set with zero elements. And then six choose two, six choose four, six choose six. These are all your positive terms. And our negative terms would be six choose one, six choose three, and six choose five. They cancel each other out, right? I could rewrite this entire equation keeping the even chooses, right? The, the even numbers on the bottom on one side and the odds on the other. And this would look like six choose zero plus six choose two plus six choose four plus six choose six is equal to six choose one plus six choose three plus six choose five. This is pretty wild, right? What does this side of the equation represent? Right, this is the subsets of a six element set, remember we're using bracket six to denote just a general six element set, of size zero or two or four or six. In other words, these are the subsets of bracket six that have an even number of elements. And on the right hand side, we have the subsets of bracket six of size one, three, or five, okay? In other words, either are the subsets of odd size, and we have the same number of each. This is surprising, right? It's not, it's not like we have a nice bijection between them because there's four different terms here and three different terms here. And so it's finding a sort of bijection between them would be a little bit harder. 
So let's try to think about why this is happening. And actually, let's try to generalize this into, into a conjecture about subsets of even size versus odd size. Right, this six is just sort of an arbitrary number. We could have done this for any n, and it looks like that alternating sum is always going to be zero. So a natural conjecture here would be, if we look at all the subsets of bracket n, we have that n choose zero plus n choose two plus n choose four, dot, dot, dot. I don't really know where to end this because I don't know if n's even or odd, so I'm just sort of letting it go indefinitely. And then on the right-hand side, we have n choose one, n choose three, n choose five, dot, dot, dot. Right, these eventually will end somewhere, but it'll depend on whether n's even or odd. We're claiming that these two things are equal to each other. Right? That's what it means to say that the alternating sum is zero in Pascal's triangle. And so what this is really saying is that uh, the number of subsets of bracket n of even size or even cardinality is equal to the number of subsets of bracket n of odd cardinality or odd size. That's what we found in, in that six case and it's what we're trying to prove in general. Now, oftentimes we wanna find like a nice combinatorial proof that explains exactly why this is happening. Um, but I'm actually gonna show you just sort of a, a slick algebra proof instead. And we're gonna make use of the binomial theorem. So recall that by the binomial theorem, we know that for any x and y, x plus y to the nth power is equal to this alternating sum, right? n choose zero x to the n plus n choose one x to the n minus one y plus n choose two x to the n minus two y to the two, etc. until we get to our last term, which would be n choose n times y to the n. All right, so this sort of like the or these, these n's, right, these binomial coefficients, n choose k's, um, become our coefficients when we expand this binomial to the nth power. Right, this is what we talked about on the last page. So how are we gonna use that here? Well, we wanna say something about the alternating sum, right? If we were to move these odd and choose odd things to the other side, we'd have an alternating sum, n choose zero minus n choose one, plus n choose two minus n choose three, et cetera. And we wanna show that it's equal to zero. So what I want to do is use the binomial theorem here and try and get an alternating sum, right? I want this to be negative, and I want this to be negative, and I want it to alternate each time. So the way that we're going to do that is we're going to let our x term be equal to, let's see, we want this to be positive. So let's let x be equal to 1, and let's let y be equal to negative 1. All right, so I'm gonna go through and write what we had before, but leave out the x and the y for now. I'll have to go one term farther. Until we get to the n choose n term. All right, but what we're doing is we're replacing x with negative one. And we're replacing y Oops, sorry, x is getting replaced with positive 1, and y is getting replaced with negative 1. Okay, so on the left-hand side, that looks like 1 minus 1 to the nth power. 1 minus 1 is just 0. 0 to any power, as long as n is not negative or not 0, uh, is, is 0. So the left-hand side, of course, is going to simplify to 0. What's going to happen on the right-hand side? Well, the first thing we have here is we have x being raised to the nth power, so 1 is being raised to the nth power. Then we have x to the n minus 1 times y to the n. Remember, y is equal to negative 1 here, so we'll have negative 1, oops, sorry, to the 1. All right, then we'll have x to the n minus 2, so that's 1 to the n minus 2 times y to the 2, so times negative 1 squared. 
then we would have, for 3, we'd have x to the third power, oops, sorry, x to the n minus 3 power times y, or negative 1 to the 3, right? And then it'll keep going from there. But what happens when you actually evaluate these, because we know what 1 to the n is, we know what 1 to the n minus 1 is, right? 1 to any power is 1, um, and negative 1 to any power, any integer power, is either going to be negative 1 if your exponent is odd, or positive 1 if your exponent's even. So the way that this turns out, we get n choose 0 times 1 here, which is just n choose 0. For this next term, we have 1 to the n minus 1 is 1 times negative 1 to the 1. So this sign is going to become a negative overall. So it'll be minus n choose 1. For our next term, for the n choose 2 term, 1 to the n minus 2 is equal to 1, and negative 1 squared is equal to positive 1. So this is going to stay positive. And similarly, this next term will be negative, and it's going to continue to alternate like that because our exponent on the negative one term is going up each time. So it's gonna switch from, here it's negative one to the zero power, so it's positive, but then negative. Then it's positive, then negative. And it's gonna keep alternating like that all the way down the line. And rearranging this equation here gets that result that we were looking for. It gets us the result that n choose zero plus n choose two, right? The even chooses n choose four are equal to n choose 1 plus n choose 3 plus n choose 5, etc. Right, that's the result that we were looking for, and so the binomial theorem proves it just by plugging in the actual x value of negative 1, or positive 1 and negative 1 for x and y. So that's sort of like a neat way to do it. There is, there is a combinatorial proof too. Um, it's a little bit harder to see. I, I encourage you to play around with it, like list out all the different subsets of a six element set maybe or six is a lot, maybe all the subsets have a four element set and see if you can find a nice bijection between the even size subsets and the odd size subsets. Okay, but let's move on to our last exercise here, which has to do with what we call northeast lattice paths. So it says, suppose you want to move from zero, zero on the Cartesian grid to one, one by moving only north or east to points with co integer coordinates. So we call such a path a lattice path or in particular, it's a northeast lattice path. And so essentially what we're trying to say is we're moving to only other points with integer coordinates. So we're either going up and then to the right, northeast, or we're going east or north. So for part A, there's only two possible paths that you can take. And you can sort of draw them out on the grid if you want, or you could just list them using the directions that you're going. So you go north and then east, or you go east and then north. So there's two paths here. Part B says, what if you were going from 0, 0 to 2, 2 instead? And this one's a little bit harder. We have to actually start listing them out a little bit more carefully. So we could go north, north, east, east. Um, I can't do anything else if I go north and north. So instead, I'm going to go north, east, and then see where I could go. So I could go north, east, north, east. Or north, east, east, north. Okay, or I could go east, east, north, north. East, east, north, north. Or I could go east, north, north, east. Or finally, east, north, east, north. All right, so hmm, it ends up being six. Now, I didn't ask you to do the three by three case, but it might be useful for trying to see. Um, the thing is, it's it, it gets pretty complicated pretty quickly, right? So actually listing out these paths, you could try to do it, but you'd have to be pretty careful here. And so it's worth thinking back to seeing if there's anything else we've done that could try and help us here. And maybe you're you're already thinking that these numbers here look familiar. From here to here, to, there's two paths, and from here to here, there's six paths. Um, if you think all the way back to our, our rook problem on a checkerboard, you're getting the same numbers as if you looked at a checkerboard and you counted the number of ways for a rook to get to some particular square on the diagonal. I'm not going to do the whole thing, but we had said if a rook started here, there were two different ways for him to get here, and there were six different ways for him to get here. 
And maybe you remember how many ways there were to get here. If you don't, you could always use Pascal's triangle because we found that we're getting the same things from Pascal's triangle here. So it ended up being 20 here. Okay, so why is that? What, what exactly is going on? Um, so, well, let's think about what we're doing when we're forming these paths. Right, any path from 0, 0 to 2, 2, for instance, is going to require four moves, right? Two moves to the north and two moves to the east in some order. Similarly, any path from 0, 0 to 3, 3 is going to require six moves. Three moves north and three moves east in some order, right? It doesn't have to be all north and all east. It's just three ends all together and three e's all together. So really what we want to count to count the number of paths from 0, 0 to NN, which is what they're asking us to find in part C, we need to count the number of sequences, count sequences that have exactly N north steps and little n east steps. Right, so you'd have something like n, 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 n many times, and then e, 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 n many times, okay? Well, this is like saying, how many total steps are gonna be in our path? There's n north steps and n east steps, so there's two n total steps to take. Here's your first step, your second step, your third, all the way down the line until you get to the two nth step. Now we need to fill these with exactly little n many norths and exactly little n many easts. So we have to choose where on this path do you want to go north? Which n spots do you want to go north in? And then once you've chosen that, all the rest of your spots have to be easts. So we can see then that there's 2n choose n many ways to select n of the spots above. to put a north move in. The remaining end spots, little end spots, are east moves. And so there's two n choose n many paths total. Right, and we can check and make sure that that's actually what we got up above. Here our n was equal to two, because we were moving to two, two. So it should be that there's four choose too many paths. That's four factorial over two factorial times two factorial, which is indeed equal to six. This should be, let's see, two n choose n in this case would be six choose three. So six factorial over three factorial times three factorial. Uh, six times five times four divided by three times two times one, which is 20. Okay, that is what we got when we did the, the Rook problem as well. Okay, so this is telling you sort of a nice way to get from 0, 0 to NN. We have this nice little formula here. Um, and a great follow-up question, something that you might want to explore, is what if we weren't just going to zero, from 0, 0 to NN? What if we were going, let's say, to N choose M for some other integer M? Right, what if we were going from 0, 0 to 5, 7? That's something that you might want to think about. It's a, it's a good natural follow-up question. Um, and that's it for now.